Hey, welcome to week five, everyone. Um, hope everybody's doing well. I know it's going fast. Uh, don't panic. You know, we still got enough time. Uh, but you definitely want to make sure you're keeping up with the readings and keeping up with the stuff. And I've been watching and saying, I appreciate the efforts that some of you have been putting in. Um, definitely got to keep it, keep it going. Uh, but I appreciate, uh, you know, eight weeks is a short time to try and swallow a lot of information. But again, I appreciate the effort that you guys are putting in. Um, this week, we're going to be talking about some challenging stuff, uh, just because it's kind of where my heart speaks to my heart with regard to the international system and, and uh, with regard to the realities of globalization and what happens as the richer countries get richer and the poorer countries get poorer. Uh, and so this week, we're going to be talking about human rights um, and the consequences of, of the lack of sometimes of international action regarding human rights. And one of the things, you have to excuse the noise out here, if it's breezy here in San Diego, um, and it's uh, uh, my, <laughs> my umbrella, which is keeping me from uh, getting burnt, too burnt. Uh, I hope it's not too, too loud and obnoxious, but uh, nonetheless, uh, one of the things that I think is really uh, important to understand is really, you know, sort of like, why is why are human rights important? Why, why should we care about what happens around the rest of the world to other people? Why does it matter what happens to the people in, in Ukraine? Do, or even more importantly, do you care about the people in Ukraine and what's happening to them? You know, does that matter to you? If it doesn't, then I would say we need to talk about that because having an insensitivity to other people uh, when it could happen to any of us, it could happen to any of our groups uh, that we come from, uh, whether by ethnicity or gender or whatever the case may be, we may, or sexual orientation, you know, there are people who will discriminate and will do harm to others. And so recognizing that and recognizing their plight and trying to do whatever we can as human beings on planet Earth to help them, I think is an, is an admirable task. And the UN certainly plays a huge part in this, uh, probably the primary organization that deals with this. And then the question is, how do we bring pressure to bear on those countries or bodies or leadership that, that violate these things? Um, today, specifically, we're going we're gonna to be looking at North Korea, uh, but you could look at this with regards to a lot of other countries as well, whether it be Saudi Arabia or Russia, of course. Uh, you know, the, the taking of human life, like what's happened in Ukraine, for example, no one would have ever thought that modern democracies would ever do this to one another. And uh, yeah, here we find ourselves in this age of economic diplomacy that human beings will attack and kill other human beings and, and do it in the most heinous of ways. And it's just the ugliness of this is it's what's so disturbing to me. Um, you know, humanitarian causes, human rights is something that we should all embrace. It's really as simple as caring about other people who may not look like you or be from where you're from. And I think that that's an admirable place to be. So I'm going to take you through a little bit, uh, show you some things about uh, human rights just in general. And then I'm going to uh, briefly just to go into a discussion about North Korea and give you some hist historical context there. And then, uh, then we'll be done for today. As you know, I try to keep these no more than 30 minutes uh, or, or sometimes less if I can. It is really because the information is available to you. So all the PowerPoints are here, all the videos are here. So you can get a lot of that stuff uh, yourself as well. Um, but I definitely want to give you the understanding, a backdrop of the understanding of what takes place and why this is so important. So without further ado, let me jump into uh, the PowerPoints uh, and kind of walk you through a few odds and ends that I think are important for you to know. Um, first of all, uh, this particular PowerPoint um, is from the uh, United Nations Office uh, for Humanitarian Human Rights uh, Organization. It's uh, from the High Commissioner's Office. And really, it's an overview of the sort of structural system that's put, to, put in place for, uh, for the international body of the, of the uh, United Nations to uh, show you the infrastructure that's put in place to deal with these things and then some of the issues that are relevant. So let me just go through um, a little bit of this with you and uh, then we'll move on. So let me see if I can get this a little full screen. I may not be able to, the slideshow kind of gets a little wonky sometimes, so bear with me one second. There we go. Okay. So uh, 
the office of the high commissioner of, of human rights is where this stems from and you know you can basically look at the structure oh, i didn't want to do this but that's okay <laughs> the structure of the of the uh of how human rights is dealt with uh, bureaucratically within the United Nations uh, uh, system is what this reflects. And it starts off, of course, with the General Assembly. And then there are entities that create, uh, the, create uh, the, the, uh, the uh, I guess you would call it almost like legislation uh, that deals with human rights issues uh, that goes to the Human Rights Council. And then on the left there, you see where they adopt various treaties and committees to deal with treaties to try to resolve some of these issues. Uh, and then there's also a process for review and procedures to deal with uh, when countries are out of compliance. Uh, and so this is kind of a basic model infrastructure uh, that shows you. So if, if a country comes to the general body with a concern of violation of human rights, let's say Ukraine, for example, they approach the General Assembly, which is the entire international body of those folks who are part of the United Nations. Um, and then from there, uh, they will create uh, uh, an, a committee uh, through the Human Rights Council to deal with uh, the, the alleged complaint or issues. Uh, whether it be issues of genocide, like in Rwanda, or human rights violations regarding what's happening with uh, a war that was uh, unjustified, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, and then, again, once the Human Rights Council gets it, it goes into their review process, and then they will set up a set of procedures. And then once they go through this sort of vetting process, then it goes into the adoption phase on the left there, where they'll either you know, agree to adopt a treaties and set up a sort of structure for doing that and then, uh, and then set up the uh, committees that will oversee or have oversight over the, the, the treaties. And that's pretty typical of how, uh, of how this process works. And there's also, uh, as you see, with regard to the General Assembly, there's a secretariat, and that's the person of the Office of the High, High Commissioner of Human Rights. Uh, and that individual is, has oversight over the entire infrastructure uh, regarding human rights issues. Okay. Um, and then you can see there are some of the issues that, that we deal with regard, in regarding human rights uh, around the world. Obviously, racial discrimination is a huge one. Torture is another. Um, uh, uh, human trafficking or enforced dis disappearances, uh, women's issues, children, migrant workers, people with disabilities. These are all various aspects of the social, economic, cultural uh, issues that we confront with regard to human rights. Uh, there have been multiple covenants uh, that have been put in place uh, with regard to how we deal with this and how it's broken down. One deals with civil, political, and social issues. Uh, and the other civil political issues, the other one deals with economic, social, and cultural issues. Uh, and so those are the, the sort of the basic construct of how they're broken down. Uh, and so this is to discuss is like the basic, again, as I mentioned about the various treaties that are put in place to deal with uh, a specific issue. So like racial discrimination or torture as they reflect here. But there are other ones, again, dealing with human trafficking, as they call it, forced disappearance. Uh, and uh, migrant workers and women and so forth. So these are just basically the, the, uh, the components that are put in place uh, to deal with these aspects. Okay, so the treaties are these treaties that they can, the human rights treaties that they create are legally binding documents. Uh, they are negotiated and adopted by the, by the various nation states within the United Nations General, General Assembly. Uh, and they have, and the countries are, have an obligation to to submit to them and uh, to follow the follow the uh, uh, the treaties as they are laid out once they are signed. And as you can see down below, there they talk about the threefold responsibility: respect, protect, and fulfill. Uh, that's an important; those are important components to making sure that each country f follows its edict and respects the treaties as they are that they have agreed to. Again, this is just another aspect of the treaty system. Uh, again, when we talk about the various mandates that are put in place to basically monitor uh, the implementation of the treaties to make sure people are following along, but we usually have a group of uh, independent experts in those regions that are basically put in place to oversee uh, uh, the 
the execution of the mandates. Uh, and there's a group of then there's a membership committee at, uh, anywhere from 10 to 25 folks who are put in place uh, to be able to oversee the mandate uh, collectively but alongside those independent experts. So the Human Rights Council itself is composed, again, as an intergovernmental body within the UN. There are 47 members uh, that are serviced by the Office of the High Commissioner. Again, they did, they address all the human rights violations that come, come to their table. Uh, and again, their goal is to work to prevent human rights abuses, uh, deal with all the, you know, the hot spots and emergencies that happen, uh, create international dialogue and forums to deal with human rights violations, recommend the development of human rights laws relevant to particular things that happen or occur. And then they review and update uh, periodically the status of countries as they go through the process and hopefully come out on a positive end of any human rights abuses that occur. Okay. So, um, so within that, again, there is this process of review that, that there is a peer review that occurs every four to five years uh, to see if the uh, mandates, the committees that are put in place to oversee the mandates are actually doing what they're supposed to do, that they filed all the requisite reports updating the, net, the General Assembly on the outcomes uh, that were put in place uh, based on the treaties. Uh, again, this is, goes through, again, more of the mechanism uh, regarding human rights and the various countries and issues that are, occur as a result of that. Okay. Um, and so let me jump back here so you can see my face. Okay. Uh, so with that, it just, that just kind of gives you sort of a, sorry, fix the screen got a little off. Um, that just gives you an idea of sort of the construct of, so the entity that the international body that's put in place to help protect, uh, citizens around the world and the issues that they're dealing with, uh, from country to country. A lot of times these events happen based on war or civil civil war inside the countries or abuses within, you know, within certain ethnic groups or ethnic rivalries in, within a country. Sometimes it deals with religious issues, like in some of the Islamic countries, the abuse of women. Uh, in some of these countries that, you know, many would argue is based on the you know, religious context or religious law. And so things like that are, take place. And then also, of course, there's the drug issue, you know, drugs and human trafficking. Uh, which is a huge problem globally, uh, those types of things. A lot of it's also, though, is based on economics as well. And, you know, economic abuse is just as toxic and dangerous as any other thing. So a lot of times what drives a lot of these uh, these actions has to do with money, unfortunately. But uh, this is sort of the world we live in. Now, particularly what I'm going to talk about is going to be North Korea uh, as one of the examples. And... North Korea is a really interesting entity because it's kind of like the ghost country. Um, very little information flows in, very little information flows out of North Korea. Uh, it's a very insular or insulated society. And uh, people there rarely, you know, don't get much information about the outside world. And, you know, it serves leadership's purpose to do so because they can create whatever myth they want about the outside world. And uh, when you have a group of folks who reside within your country who basically are taught only what's inside the bubble, it's easy to create a dangerous construct of what the outside world is like. And that along with forbidding um, a lot of your country to have any uh, access to the outside world uh, certainly leaves uh, North Korea uh, in a very uh, problematic state. Uh, North Korea really hasn't been, in terms of the what we know as the country of North Korea, really hasn't been around that long, just after World War II, as a matter of fact. Uh, but it's interesting how the deification of North Korea, uh, the leaders of North Korea, has just been, a, more, again, a very recent entity that, uh, you know, one leader comes to power, creates this myth of him being like a, the god, and, so, and is able to perpetuate or create that mythos and then fortify it by not allowing the people to, to look outside of the of the uh, the bubble to decide for themselves and be have re reasonable thought about challenging whether it's true or not. Uh, this is what allows for it to be a much more problematic scenario. 
Ironically, <laughs> it's interesting to note that a lot of the countries that were involved and engaged in North Korea before it separated from the North and South uh, really cre have created the damage that North Korea now resides and uh, exists with. Um, it's interesting how, uh, like for Japan, for example, uh, who was involved, engaged in North Korea for a while before it spun into its own, uh, treated the North Koreans horribly uh, and wouldn't let them speak their own language. They had to take Japanese names. Uh, and so there's the sense of loss of identity. Uh, and then you can see a rising sense of sort of nationalism that occurs as a process of byproduct of that. Uh, you can see some, in some ways, how this actually manifested and why it came to be uh, with regard to people wanting to sort of close themselves off and, and also isolate themselves from the rest of the world. Uh, because the rest of the world basically watched while Japan did this. Uh, so you could see how in some ways it's, you can create uh, you can you can create them your own monsters, and that certainly is the case in this situation. But let me jump in and share with you uh, some things with North Korea, and uh, then we'll go through and then we'll wind down there. Just a second here. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to share with you is just to give you some sort of a general overview before I get into more specifics about uh, about North Korea. So let me step you through just some basic items. Uh, and just to sort of explain about North Korea. So basically, as you can see geographically, North Korea resides uh, and basically an appendage of, of the Chinese mainland. And uh, as you see to the east is the Sea of Japan and sometimes called the East Sea and to the west, the Yellow Sea. You can see that it is, uh, there are uh, distinct uh, uh, parallels between North and South Korea. Uh, and you can see that uh, it is North Korea is still very much tied to the Chinese mainland uh, and also not too far from Russia as a, also in the process. So that's kind of geographically where it sits, you know, not too far from Japan. And uh, this is always quite a hotbed for uh, intrigue and political action. Uh, they, none of these countries really like each other. So it's even though they're all blood relatives, uh, distant cousins. So just some of the basic uh, facts. So again, the Communist Party, which was founded in 1948 after World War II, has a population of about 22 and a half million people. Um, healthcare, basically about 2% of their gross domestic product is uh, spent on healthcare. So basically they're not taking care of their people. Infant mortality rate is very, very, uh, very, very high, uh, meaning that they don't let their children are, are dying uh, or are stillborn. Life expectancy is very low, as you can see, 64 for men and 68 for women. That's relatively low in the world we live in today. And there are reasons for that. Um, a lot of it has to do with starvation and some other things, pretty horrific things, actually, that we find out about North Korea, which I'll speak to in a little bit. Uh, literacy rates, about 99%. Uh, that number is not true. <laughs> Uh, the poor and 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 those who are in who, those who are uh, in distress, uh, many of them can't read. A lot of them are not allowed to read. So that number is only based on the people who live in the urban areas for the most part, and not the people who are the poor and disenfranchised. There is one political party, the Korean Workers Party. It is headed by uh, Kim Jong Un now, uh, and we'll talk about the leaders and leadership a little bit later, but. Uh, You'll see here the first dictator was Kim Jong Il, and he died. Well, he actually is not the first. His father was the first, but he died in in 2011. Uh, but this is the uh, the sort of the primary uh, leadership within within uh, within their political system. Here's Kim Jong Un. Here's his father, Kim Kim Jong Il. Uh, these are folks uh, who have been. Uh, directly uh, in responsible inside of, of this country and creating the mythology within the country. Uh, it has the fourth largest military uh, in the world. However, it's that if this is in terms of people, in terms of actual abilities, uh, because they have nuclear weapons, that's really the only threat that they really have. If they have the fighter planes and the military and the tanks are all outdated equipment that they've been sold to them. Not that it's still not, you know, of course, you know, deadly, but uh, the new technology, they've not been provided. 
Um, the per capita GDP, $1,000. So imagine that uh, $1,000 a year is the per capita GDP with sign of North Korea. Uh, and it's $18,000 uh, in South Korea. And when you look at the U.S., the per capita is 47000 And in Qatar, which is the Middle East, is 179000 And then some of the human rights issues that we're talking about, one is the malnutrition. And again, more than 13 million suffer from malnutrition. 60% of all children are malnourished. And here's a, one of the scary and sad and frightening uh, uh, non-public made comments regarding uh, North Korea and the malnourishment. Uh, when things are really bad, uh, they are, there have been many instances of cannibalism. And they have been, unfortunately, uh, many children who who have been who have been killed and uh, used for food uh, when when starvation sets in. Uh, this is really apparent. In 1995, they had a three-year cycle of famine uh, in in North Korea, and about 220,000 people died, and some of those folks were cannibalized. Uh, and so. Uh, Basically, they they really estimated that about about ten percent of their population was lost during that uh, during that famine cycle, and the average uh, life expectancy fell about six years during that period. Uh, so it's interesting that a, that a leader could have carried that much power in the midst of destroying his own people and uh, basically spending all the money on military and. You know, uh, Kim Jong uh, Un, the son, is worth about five billion dollars, and his people are starving, and uh, it's, it's really quite a tragedy uh, in, in waiting to happen. So, I'm going to jump to another set of slides now and get into more specifics. On this. Okay, so uh, again, this is just going to talk a little bit more about the details and a little bit more about the leadership as well and how they kind of came to be where they are. Um, so, you know, in this, the questions of the secession and we'll be looking at, you know, like the, some of the intricacies of, of, uh, of North Korea. So again, as I said, there's the map shows you where North Korea is located, which we already know is, you know, in, uh, in between the, the East Sea and the Yellow Sea. Uh, and then, uh, again, that's just geographic information. You know, obviously, it's it's interesting how they call it the Democratic People's Republic of North of Korea. Uh, however, it is clearly not a democracy. It is an autocracy, an authoritarian system. Uh, it is, uh, you know, democracies are where you have an election process and a system in place that allows who to decide who your leader is. That is definitely not the case in this in uh, in this situation. Uh, you know, they it's a, it's a communist system. Um, where you know on in, altruistically the workers actually own everything but in truth they don't own, they don't control anything it's only the illusion of that that they perpetuate that allows for the leaders to to uh, control the system so as i said north korea is really a relatively recent entity you're talking really 74 years that it's been in existence and if you note, uh, the first leader was called the great leader was Kim Il Sung, and he was the first premier from 1948 to 1994. So he ruled for a very long time, and he's the person who basically set up the this sort of mythos about the that the leader was basically like the god king, and uh, this is what. Uh, he perpetuated after Japan left and has lived with this legacy and passed it on to his son, who was Kim Jong-il, uh, who was considered the second premier. He lasted from 1994 to 2011 when he died. And then he passed that on to his son, uh, Kim Jong-un. And he has been called the great successor. And this has basically been three generations of folks who have, for the past 74 years, been able to change in that period of time the complete direction of a country 
in a way that no one would have ever expected and uh, have done so fairly well with the, because of the fact that the people that Kim Jong-un takes care of as his father did and as his father's father did, uh, they take care of the, they build a very strong military infrastructure. They paid them very, very well to take care of things. And so when you think about what allows you to control the masses, it's because you've got weaponry and people who will keep, keep the myth going, almost like Nazi Germany in a lot of ways in terms of the construct and what they've been allowed to perpetuate in that country. Uh, so this is examples of showing you the capital city. Uh, and it is the place where most of the, the elites go. If you're, if you're living in the city, it's, it's because you are an elite or a rebel or a true believer or well connected. That's the only people who get to really live in the city, not any of the peasants or poor people. They are not allowed in the cities. They, in fact, you would probably never ever see them. Um, it's always been, North Korea has always been called the hermit kingdom. Uh, and going back historically, um, it's always had uh, very limited contact with the outside world uh, and has always been sort of had an isolationist doctrine um, as part of its uh, part of its historical legacy. It's a very secretive country. They don't allow many people inside the house. Um, and even as far as the current leader, as you can see, they, they've only had one picture of him prior to that was public prior to 2010. And that's the only known picture of Kim Jong-un when he was just a little kid. Um, and then we talk about like, you know, sort of the, the cult of personality, you know, these leaders and how they manage to perpetuate and create and deify themselves or create almost like a cult reality uh, within these entities is what's been so prolific. Uh, so any, most music and art and, and sculptures have been built around, you know, deifying the leader of the country. And uh, in fact, uh, Kim Il-sung had over 34 statues of himself built around the country to make to make himself almost like the God King uh, during his time in power. And of course, like most, in fact, this, this happens even, even in our own country, uh, this sort of cult of personality, uh, when you have an individual who can use the media and propaganda to sort of create the mythology about themselves and give themselves a paint a very, you know, sort of like they use the word flattering image and, and they almost create like a cult-like status for these individuals. Um, and actually I said 34, it's actually 34,000 statues that Kim Il-sung had built for himself. <laughs> 34,000, think about that for a moment. That's pretty nuts. Uh, and then as far as you know, maintaining that, if you try to, to speak up or step out of line bad things would happen to you, very bad things, typically. Um, it's ironic to note that even those who, like in Kim Jong-un, when his father died, um, P, if you didn't cry and look like you were sincerely crying at, at, at his father's death, then you could be thrown in jail and punished uh, severely for, for not uh, crying at his father's uh, funeral. Now, the system that's in place, the sort of ideological system uh, of, of the North Koreans is called the Juche system. And basically it's a system that focuses on the sort of national self-reliance, it's really extreme isol isolation and racial purity. And, you know, North Koreans are not allowed to marry outside uh, of, their, of their ethnicity. Uh, they, if they do, they're, and maybe I would say in the West, there's probably a little more, you know, there, those who have moved to the West probably have changed that a little bit, but it's still uh, a very sort of closed society, even in Western parts where they have like Koreatown and places like that, where you don't have a lot of mixing. And a lot of that may still stem from that system that they've grown up with and have been socialized with. Uh, this just speaks to, the, of course, the, the nuclear threat of North Korea, you know, and it's interesting to note that, uh, you know, spending the money to build missiles and weapons of mass destruction in the midst of your people starving is a pretty, it says a lot about where your, where your interests happen to lie. Uh, but, uh, you know, and after September 11, George, uh, then President uh, Bush called, made list of them as part of the axis of evil. And uh, at the time, they North Korea got really all upset about it, and they withdrew from the 
Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, and then they started going about testing nuclear missiles again. Um, however, we all recognize that people in the real world recognize that Kim Jong-un would never, it's just the logic of him uh, ever using one would, would be almost impossible because the, the consequence of losing his power and the things that drive him uh, and drive all those leaders like that, like ego and power and having a vast amount of wealth, he's not trying to kill himself. He's not trying to martyr himself. Uh, so I don't see that that's really a potential threat for the world, even though regionally, Countries like Japan obviously worried because it's right across the water. And, and of course, China and other places may also have a moment of pause because of the general geopolitical situation and also the, the location of the country. And this just outlines some of their aggressive actions, uh, which they have taken uh, just to try to shake up everyone. Uh, and as you saw earlier, just the money they spend on the military is just uh, it's just incredible. It's like the we live in a world generally that is focused much more diplomatically on economic viability that, as opposed to uh, military spending. This is what actually drowned the Soviet Union uh, in 1990, uh, 8990, was because they had, the the Cold War had moved from military and moved to money, and they were still building much of all their money on weaponry when there were there were no wars to fight. <laughs> so. Uh, North Korea is still doing that and uh, it basically starving their people in the process. Uh, you know, it's always taken on this sort of, North Korea's always taken this sort of us versus them mentality. Uh, it's always been like throughout the last 2000 years, like it has been, it's been invaded by lots of folks. And, uh, you know, the idea of its resiliency and fighting back has always been what they hold on to. Just like that cliche that they speak when it says, when whales fight, the shrimp's back is broken. Uh, this is just to describe again, just how, almost like a sense of asymmetric warfare where smaller countries, less powerful countries can, can still control the outcome against bigger, stronger countries. This just goes to some more historical context uh, and uh, what, what happened when Japan took over and controlled North Korea. Uh, so, for, you know, as you can see, it invaded, North, it invaded Korea in 1910 and basically ruled for 35 years, uh, particularly, but mainly, do you see the, uh, the reality and ugliness comes in the last, post, certainly post-World War II, but they were really harsh to them. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they couldn't work. The Japanese took over every aspect of their lives. That's why there's historical baggage between the two countries that will last probably long after we're gone. Uh, you know, because of what happened for those th during that 35 year period. Um, again, 1945, it's liberated from Japan, but the legacy of J Japanese, uh, and, uh, the Japanese certainly was uh, pro problematic. And then the USSR t came in and uh, basically pushed Korea to be a communist country. And of course, the United States wanted, didn't want that to happen. So the country is divided, leads to the Korean War. Um, and that's where they stayed um, and still stay to this day. Um, again, 1950, uh, Kim Il-sung uh, ordered North Korean to military to attack the South, and that's where the, the Korean War started. Uh, by this time, he'd already fortified himself and his rule as the, you know, as the dictator of the country. <clears throat> <clears throat> this just shows you the death amount during the Korean War. Um, you can see civilians that were dead or missing from North Koreans, 600,000. Military killed and missing, about 400,000. And then uh, another 1.5 military that were wounded. So about a million people were killed in that war and from the North, from North Korea. Uh, and you can see the other casualties as well. The armistice was signed in uh, 1953, uh, and they agreed to stop fighting. However, they still, it was never an official war, so it was never really officially declared, but at the 38th parallel, they've been shooting at each other ever since that time. Uh, they call it a demilitarized zone, but it's, uh, it's like a buffer zone between the north and the south. Um, it's 160 miles long and about two and a half miles wide. Uh, there's over a million landmines that have been posted around it, and there are about two million soldiers guarding it. So it's 
it's a hot zone, even though it's it, it's just you know a million minds imagine that. So, um, so this is where we find North Korea today, and uh, still isolated, even though Kim Jong Un certainly likes Western things. Um, he has to keep continue to create the mythos of, that he is the supreme leader. He's got a strong military behind him that he has to make sure, recognize, and respect him. Otherwise, leaders there have a tendency to wind up dead when they don't. So it's important that he keeps that mythos uh, perpetuated. And a lot of his family and folks are in the periphery are also tied to this. Um, his uncle certainly is, and his uncle's family has been, who's a military general, certainly have been part and parcel of that. Um, so in the meantime, um, this is where we find ourselves. And ironically, it tells an interesting story about uh, human rights and, and how people can suffer and be and how they get, you can have a leader that stays in power even through uh, the heinous acts that he commits against his people. Uh, and again, the helplessness of the Korean, of the, uh, most of the North Koreans, even if you try to save them, um, so many of them are so blinded by what, is, what they've been socialized with for the last, you know, since whenever they were born. It's very difficult to unwind that, to recondition them. It's almost like it would take a generation or two if it were if the, if the regime were ever toppled uh, and did, I'm reminding the, the military apparatus to even change the mindset of the folks who live there to open themselves up to outside influences. And uh, so this is, again, one of many uh, countries that has a variety of different human rights abuses. and. But again, it's you know it doesn't change unless the international body is aware and sensitive and cares about protecting the rights and sanctity of life, not just in their own countries, but in the countries around the world. Um, that's it for week five. Um, I will see you next week. We're almost there. So hang in there, right? And we'll get done. You guys take care. Have a great day. All right.